want to do is give me confidence and comfort in you as a manager and somebody who can manage the business and can effectively manage an investment of my money. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Entrepreneurship 101 and one of the almost final lectures for the season. Aww. Um, it's, it will be missed by myself and my team over the summer. It's been, it's been an exciting almost 30 weeks. So we are, we're looking forward to the pitch competition on May 14th. Uh, so it's going to be a bit sad to, to not have anything on a Wednesday evening after, after May 14th. So if you haven't, but if you have not registered for Upstart, please do so. It's going to be pretty exciting. We have 12 companies this year. I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening, Shirley Speakman, who is going to speak about raising money from venture capitalists. But, but before I do a proper introduction of Shirley, who is back for the third year, I believe we do have a few announcements. As you know, if you have not had your stamp card stamped, we close the registration desk at about 6.15, so you have time to sneak out, get it stamped, and come back. A uh, shout out to our webcast participants at Norcat Innovation Factory and Haltech. Always a pleasure having you join us. We do have a couple announcements about some events we have coming up. So we have a best practices, a Mars best practices event coming up on the 5th of May on tips for selling into the education system. So if you are in the education innovation space and you need to know, um, you need some information on how to get into to sell into that space, particularly in the United States. This is going to be very, very beneficial. We have a panel moderated by John McLeod and consisting of Scott Welch from Edsby, Mohsen Shahini from Top Hat, and Stuart Bonus from Media Core. It's going to be very exciting. It's on the 5th of May. And it's the last in our education innovation series. We had two other best practices events around that series, and this is the last one. It's $15 for early bird registration and $20 for regular registration. Mars is, right now we're in the middle of a financial literacy survey. Mars, in partnership with Ontario's largest credit union, Meridian, uh, has put this survey together with the intention of improving the services that we offer, that Mars, generally speaking, offers to early stage technology-based entrepreneurs. Um, the survey is available and the link is there. That's actually a bitly link, so it's a little shorter than the, the, the long form link. And it's, our effort is toward understanding the current stage of financial literacy of Ontario's technology-based startups. The survey, on, it's pretty short. It should take 10 to 15 minutes of your time. And if you fill it out, you'll be entered into a drawing for one of $200 Amazon gift cards. So there's some incentive to actually completing the survey. And again, it's fairly short. And it will help us, it will help you help us to improve the services that we offer. Finally, before I introduce Shirley, or E101 certificates, or Entrepreneurship 101 certificates, if you're very keen on getting a certificate at the end of the course, um, you know that you've had to, you have, you need to have had participated in at least 60%, so 20 out of 30 of the lectures, whether live, in person, or via webcast, whether they're live or archived webcast. If you'd like a certificate, Info sheets. We will have info sheets available. There is uh, an FAQ on the website, and you can to do that. You can submit your stamp cards as well as a request either in person at the registration desk before a lecture, or you can email us for that information and um, to put in your request for your certificate. So moving on to better things, to introduce Shirley. Shirley is a partner at Cycle Capital Management, which is a well-regarded Quebec-based clean tech fund investing in companies, developing and commercializing clean technologies, and striving to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, optimize resource use, and improve process efficiency throughout a product's life cycle. Before joining Cycle Capital, Shirley was the investment director with the Investment Accelerator Fund here at Mars. She joined in 2008, shortly after the launch of the program. And during her tenure at the IAF, Shirley led investments in 27 companies, which is about over 30% of the IAF's portfolio. Her track record has been excellent with several successful exits and a portfolio of growing companies. She has a reputation for being one of the most active venture capitalists in the industry, and I was told this morning, also has a reputation for the ability to say no. 
I don't know what that means. I'll leave it up to her to explain that. She has earned the respect of both the entrepreneurs and the co-investors she has worked with. And it was this reputation within the venture industry that caught the eye of Cycle Capital. And she, she joined them very recently. We're very glad to have her back. Um, she's still very close to our hearts and somewhat close to us in terms of proximity. She's not far away. Her office is not far away. Please join me in welcoming Shirley to the stage. So thank you very much for that warm introduction. Um, and yes, I'm the lady from Mars who says no, or has historically said no. It's a talent that I garnered over a few years. And, and as I explain uh, what venture capitalists want, you'll begin to understand why I've developed that, re that uh, reputation. Um, tonight's talk really re revolves around helping you understand how to work with venture capitalists, what their expectations are with the hopes that at the end of the day, you'll be able to do that better if you decide that the venture capital route is a way that you want to go. So in my, in my history, what I have found is it's often very helpful to create bridges for people um, when I try to get people to, to understand each other. So the first place I'll start is by saying that you have something in common with venture capitalists, believe it or not. You want money, and they want money as well. They're just a bit different. They want big money. They want really big money. And they want really big money for a couple of reasons. And it really revolves around the model that venture capitalists follow and the way the numbers have played out for us. Um, we pretty much need to make sure that every investment that we make has the opportunity to be a big win. So let's just walk through a little bit of that. Um, at the end of the day, my job is really about kissing a lot of frogs. So I'm trying to say no to as, as few frogs as possible. But really, um, I end up having to see probably about 1,000 companies in order to make 10 investments. Because of those 10 investments, two, probably one, will make the return for my entire portfolio. That means I've got six investments that generally live in the world that we call in our business the land of the living dead. And then there'll be two that are spectacular failures. So essentially, my one or two winners need to offset the risk of my, lo my losers. And that means that for a startup company like many of yours, as a venture capitalist, I'm looking to get about a 10 to 12x return on my money in a five to seven year time horizon. And if you're a bit more of a mature company, depending on what stage you're at, that, that, that expectation changes a bit. It goes from the 10 to 12 times return to a five to seven in a, in a tighter time horizon. And that's, that's what's driving my model. We're in a high-risk business at the end of the day, and those winners have to pay for the losers. So what that means for you is that a company that doubles in revenue isn't, it's not, it's not that it's not good enough. It frankly just meets the bar as a startup. Now step back and think about that. Doubling in size every year just makes my expectation. Now, you might think that that's an impossible bar to set, but it's not. There's a little company that you might be familiar with, a little company called YouTube. So YouTube was a, an early investment of a granddaddy venture capital fund called Sequoia. And this is how the numbers panned out for Sequoia. YouTube sold to Google for $1.65 billion. I love that word, billion. It's a nice word from my perspective. Sequoia invested $11.5 million, and that investment garnered them a $495 million return, in essence, for their 30% return in the investment in the company. That creates a 43 times return. So in light of that, my 10 to 12 times uh, return doesn't look so unachievable, does it? So that's a, fundamentally, that's a great deal, and it truly is an anomaly in the business. 
that, that investment would have made that fund for Sequoia, for sure, right? So what's a reasonable expectation for you as, a, as an entrepreneur? Reasonably, you should expect it to take six to nine months to raise money. That might seem like a really long time frame. And in your world where you're fighting every day to grow your business, find customers, decide where to allocate your resources and your time, it's, it is a long time. But from my perspective as a venture capitalist, I need to get to know you. People have invested in my fund, trusting me to get them a return. I cannot write a check to somebody I don't know. I cannot write a check to someone who hasn't demonstrated some, some evidence that what they say they are going to do, they do, and they do it well. And as you get to know me and I get to know you, I want to make sure that what you tell me you're going to do is pretty much close to the truth. And it's at that point that I have much more confidence in my ability to invest in you. So take that away with you, you know, six to nine months to get to know the venture, for the venture capitalist to get to know you as a potential investee. But that also means that you've got time to get to know the venture capitalist. And frankly, if they're doing their due diligence and homework on you, it's incumbent upon you to do the due diligence and homework on a venture capitalist. Get to know their process. Get to know who makes the decision in the fund. If you're talking to an associate or an analyst, you're not very far along in, in the investment decision process in most venture capital funds. Where are they in their life cycle? Are they just starting out? Or at the, are they at the end of their 10-year fund life? Most venture capital funds have a life expectancy. It's typically 10 years. If you are an early stage startup company, you probably don't want to be talking to somebody who has three years left on their fund. It's a waste of your time because you won't meet their needs in the time frame that they have left. Find out what their last deal was. In this business, it's all about the last deal that a venture capitalist did. Did they make a return on it? Are they going to, be, are they going to expect you to be the one or are they going to expect you to be the, the, the land of the, the living dead? Um, talk to their existing CEOs. Are, are they a good investor in good times and in bad? And make sure you understand how much capital they have to invest at the initial date and then for follow-on financings. What you want to make sure is that your venture capital partner is a partner and not just a partner for today, but a partner for the long run. So what's next? Rise above the noise. It's the other tip I'll have for you tonight. Um, as I said, I see 1,000 thousand companies in order to invest in 10. So how do you get to be one of the companies that I see, and how do you get to be one of the companies that I actually spend some time with? And the best way to do that is to get referred in. Yes, we all, all venture capitalists have websites. All venture capitalists have websites where you can put in your business plan. I can tell you exactly where that lands up on my desk. So it's really important for you to try to get to see me through somebody in my trusted network. So at the end of the day, if you can't get to see me, and it's my job to go out and find high potential companies, how difficult is it for you to get to see a customer who probably doesn't want to meet you? It's, it's gonna be a harder sell to find a customer than it is, gonna, is, than it is going to be to find me. So it's almost like a, 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 a litmus test of your, your ability to be a strong entrepreneur. Next. Make sure that there is a good fit between who you are and the venture capitalists that you're dealing with. This is going to be a marriage. And it's going to be a marriage until exit do you part, as they say. Which is why it's so important to know who the venture capitalist is, where they are in their life cycle, what they like to deal with through the cycles of a company. 
And even more importantly, as we, get, as we drill down into some of the terms and conditions that I want to talk to you about, understanding who that venture capitalist is and where they are helps you understand some of the more onerous and contentious terms that you'll probably see in a term sheet. So speaking of the term sheet, let's talk about what that is, because I think a lot of people are here because they want to understand what that happens to be. Uh, so at its very basic, a term sheet is nothing but a non-binding, non-binding offer to invest in your company. And it generally lays out the high level terms and conditions that I'm willing to make that investment, uh, make that investment on. So the thing to keep in mind is that these terms and conditions can change throughout the process. So I'll probably be doing more due diligence on you. And as a result, some of the stuff that you see in the term sheet may in fact change. Hence the reason it's non-binding. Um, it, is, it is a place to start the, top, the, the talk on, on the investment. Um, and everybody that I know uses one. Um, I know there's this um, uh, mythology about people who um, do a deal on a handshake. And that may happen. I just, I've never been involved in one of those. Um, and I think they probably happen more often than not between people who know each other, people who are friends and family, or people who can really afford to, to play with their own money. It's not something that, as a venture capital fund, I can do. I've got investors who expect a bit more discipline from me than that. So let's talk about some of the, um, the non-contentious, non-heartache terms and conditions that you're going to see. That's pretty much it. I can guarantee you that everything else in the term sheet that you're going to see is going to give either you heartache or your venture capitalist heartache as you enter into negotiations. So I don't mean to be facetious, but that's, that is a, a bit of the, the truth. Um, there are a number of terms and conditions that will require negotiation, that will require um, give and take. And the biggest one is valuation. And I'm going to be honest with you, valuation is an art at an early stage. It's, it's not a science. Um, basically, you don't have cash flows to discount. You generally don't have revenues upon which to do a multiple. You might try to be, you might, you might, you might want to use a comparable uh, to another company. But you're not that company. You're not that management team. So it is an art, and it, it is the element of negotiation. But it's. I don't want to make it sound like it's it's completely a you know thumb in the air and there there is a little bit of science behind it. You spend a lot of time working on your forecasts, and they all frankly end up looking like that hockey stick, right? Um, so I take those forecasts, and the first thing that I'm going to do is discount them by twenty to fifty percent, because my history tells me that not one of you have actually ever delivered 100% to the plan that you have provided me. So whether it's 20%, 25%, or 50% really depends on where you are and, and how much traction and how much credibility I can put into your forecast. But what I wanted to point out is, is a former colleague of mine here at Mars, Charles Plant, did a marvelous study a while ago that took a look at a number of startup companies. And basically, his analysis said, that it takes about six years for a startup company to get to $10 million. And I'll tell you, most of the startup companies that I see tell me they're going to be at $10 million in two and a half years. So you understand why I discount your forecasts. Then on top of that, what I'll do is I'll layer on a financing strategy. It's going to take you twice as long and twice as much money to get to where you think you're going to be. And so my hope is that we go out, we do the seed round, I do it at a certain valuation, you, know, you, you deliver some milestones like we, the, uh, the presentation talked about before me, and that creates a bump up in value, and it just keeps going based on milestones and based on the amount of money that you need. Then what we say is, OK, but what's, what does the market value you at? And let's take a, a standard multiple. Let's say it's a three times multiple. And this is where valuation becomes contentious. Because if you take a look at the, see where it says that, that straight line where it says series B, and you've got the green line tracking to it? So the green line 
is the thing that says your company's worth three times revenue. Well, everything left of that inflection point means the investor, the venture capitalist, has overpaid because he's given you the Series A valuation, he's given you the early Series B valuation. A VC is always going to believe they overpay at an early stage. That's the inherent contentious nature. It's an, it's an inherent dichotomy. So if, we do, if, you've, if you can get your head wrapped around valuation, and you can understand that there is undoubtedly an inherent conflict between what you expect for valuation and what the math tells the venture capitalist is reasonable for valuation, then we're going to get into the talk about what type of shares that we're going to invest in. And there's common shares, and there's preferred shares. Most of the venture capitalists that I know will invest in preferred shares. And it's the simple difference between a common share and a preferred share is that on liquidation, a preferred share gets paid out first. That's the simple difference. Then as venture capitalists, we layer on a whole slew of other characteristics that play to our benefit. Uh, things like dividends. So typically, a pref share will now have a dividend accrue to it every year. It's not paid out. It's not paid out in cash. It just accrues. And right now, the going rate's probably about 8% for a dividend. This becomes important because over time, that dividend builds up. But more importantly, it's important on a, another term we have that we in, introduce into a pref share called a liquidation preference. And this is important to you because a liquidation preference fundamentally guarantees a venture capitalist a, a return. The return is the original issue price, whatever they paid, a buck a share, plus the 8% dividend. So that's their guaranteed return. And frankly, in good times, it doesn't really matter because they'll just convert their shares to common shares and everybody will go away and be happy billionaires. It's when you end up with a suboptimal exit. So on the left, you've got the good times. Everybody's happy. Everybody leaves a millionaire. On the right, you have the situation where the venture capitalist has their liquidation preference. They have their guaranteed return. So let's say the exit is $100. The liquidation preference would give the venture capitalist their guaranteed return of their, their investment plus 8% fixed return. That just means that there's less of the residual to share among the, the other shareholders. So just watch what that liquidation preference, preference is and what it, what it incorporates. So sometimes it's a one times liquidation preference, which is the original issue price plus the accrued dividends. Sometimes, depending on what you negotiate on valuation, you'll see the venture capitalists want to have a multiple liquidation preference, a two times liquidation preference. Back in the heyday of the internet bubble, I saw liquidation preferences as high as 12 times. So you can imagine what the exit multiple needed to be in order for the founder or early stage investors, what that exit needed to be in order for them to walk away with anything, okay? Next big um, issue is anti-dilution. So these, we're starting to get into the terms and conditions that matter in bad times. When you're not the Sequoia exit of YouTube to Google for billions of dollars. When we're suboptimal, when you're not the 10 or 12 times return, okay? This, these are the type of anti-dilution, liquidation preferences, and some of the other things that you're going to see is all about protecting the downside for the venture capitalist. What is anti-dilution? Anti-dilution protects the venture capitalist from a down round. So let's say I've put my money into your company at a dollar per share. And unfortunately, circumstances happened that the next round, because you missed a milestone or the market moved on you, had to be done at a price per share lower than a dollar per share. Let's say 50 cents. So on a full ratchet, anti-dilution protection, a venture capitalist will tell you if you subsequently raise money at a lower price than I paid, you will then issue me the number of shares to get me 
to the same lower price per share that the next round of investors had. So I originally paid a buck a share. You went out, you raised money at 50 cents a share. Now you give me enough shares to get me to an average price of 50 cents a share. That's full ratchet anti-dilution protection. The other type of anti-dilution protection is something called weighted average, which would take the buck a share, the number of shares issued at a buck a share, and the number of shares issued at 50 cents, do a weighted average between the two of them, and let's say it came out to 75 cents, you then have to issue me, the venture capitalist, the number of shares required to get me to an average price of 75 cents. So also just a term to watch as you're negotiating with the venture capitalist. Are you willing to negotiate full ratchet anti-dilution protection because you're absolutely sure that you will never have a down round? Or are you, or would you prefer to have a weighted average anti-dilution protection? Which basically says, look, I recognize you're the venture capitalist. I recognize that you've got investors. I recognize that you've got to protect your downside. But frankly, you know, we, I, I asked you to come in as an investor because I thought you could add value. And if we didn't get the up round that we were expecting, maybe it's both of our faults and we should share in, in the negative impact of this down round. Just a thought. Next is a redemption. So again, let's go back to some of that early discussion about making sure you know who your venture capitalist is and where they are in their life cycle. So if you've got a venture capitalist who is uh, coming towards the exit time horizon of their fund, which is that five to seven year time horizon, you can bet everybody's, well, first of all, everybody's going to want a, a redemption because venture capitalists are in the business to exit and provide a return to their investors. So they have to have a mechanism to, to create an exit, to get their money back. So that's what a redemption does. What's important is to understand where the venture capitalist is in their life cycle and what their propensity to trigger that redemption clause happens to be. So what a redemption clause will do is, as a venture capitalist, I can come back to the company after a particular period of time, typically about five years, and say, I need you to buy back my shares. And that allows me to get my money back out and give it back to my investors. The, the hard part is what happens if the company doesn't have the cash to pay the redemption feature? That means that the, the company has given the venture capitalist essentially the right to sell the company. So uh, that's a very important clause to understand and how it gets triggered and when it gets triggered and the propensity of the venture capitalist to trigger it. So again, another good reason to check out who to, to, to do your due diligence and reference checks on the venture capitalists and talk to their existing investors. Next are approvals. The minute that you go out and ask for other people's money, decisions are no longer solely yours to make. So if you're not willing to start to share in the decision making, then you probably shouldn't be seeking outside investment. Um, the approvals that we're seeking aren't really uh, preventing you, um, they're really preventing you from doing something, right? So changing the nature of the business, which really kind of makes sense. I've, in, I've invested in a software company, not a widget manufacturer. So you're changing the investment profile for me. Changing the capital structure, which would include issuing new types of shares uh, senior to me. Um, I want to make sure that I have approval over the business plan. Changes in key employees. One of, the key, one of the key elements of my due diligence and why it takes six to nine months to make an, a venture capital investment is because I have to get to know you. And really, I'm investing in you and your management team. So if that's going to change, you better want to know. Um, there will undoubtedly be a, a demand for a creation of, or, or change in the ESOP. Are you going to increase it or are you going to decrease it? Um, and then unbudgeted, and unbudgeted expenditures. And I put up $5,000 because that's typical for a startup. 
Um, that number can go much higher if you're a later stage or if you have more traction or you're a more experienced management team. And frankly, the, the list goes on and on and on. It, it, and it really comes down to, and I can't reiterate this enough tonight, get to know your VC. Do your due diligence on them and ask their existing investees how, how and what they are like to deal with. Okay? Information rights. Um, I don't invest in a company to have the company go away and never talk to me again. Um, I have reporting requirements to my investors, so you have reporting requirements to your investors. Um, and you know, you, you, when you ask for other people's money, there's an incumbent responsibility on you to make sure that you meet those, you keep them well informed. And frankly, if you're going through an Entrepreneurship 101 class, you probably know that you need monthly financial statements to manage your business. So it shouldn't be a surprise that a venture capitalist would ask for unaudited monthly financial statements so that they can monitor their investment. Uh, they'll want quarterly financials that give them a benchmark. This is what you said you were going to do in the projections, and this is what you actually did. Let's talk about why there are differences. Um, of course, I'm, I'm going to want to see board material, um, and I'll definitely want to see a yearly operating plan. You know, we've made an investment. What are your plans for the money? If it's a tranched investment, what are you going to do with the next tranche of money? Um, do you need to raise more money in the next year in order to achieve your business milestones? So it's all about keeping your investors well informed and keeping them up to date. Share restrictions. Um, these impact founders um, insofar as when I put my money in, I need to make sure that, well, if it, let me go back to the, I've invested in you. So if you've decided that you want to sell your shares of the company, what is that signaling to me? So generally, a venture capitalist will have restrictions on the amount of shares that you can sell to a third party or put into a family trust or all of that sort of stuff, um, which I think is frankly reasonable if you've come to me saying, I'm building a company and I want you to invest in my company. then. Yeah, I can, you, you can probably appreciate that I, I want to make sure that you are in the company and that your economic uh, return and your wealth are tied to creating value in the company. Uh, other types of restrictions are, are things that impact my ability to get an exit. Because let's go back to my original statement. A VC is in the business to create value and then make a return for their investors. So a drag along is the ability for a venture capitalist or a percentage of the venture, venture capitalist to say, we have received a third party offer to buy the company and we would like to sell the company. So what you want to do is make sure that you understand what that threshold is um, and put parameters on that. A tag along is another way a venture capitalist can get an exit. So let's say a third party comes to an investor and says, I'd like to buy your shares. A tag along allows the other investors in the company to say, I want to participate in the sale of those shares based on the pro rata distribution of the number of shares that are available. So if I own 60% of the shares and there's an offer to, to buy shares, I get to sell 60%, up to 60% of what that is, okay? So those are all ways indirect ways that a VC can get an exit. The board, um, I'll go back to the other people's money. As soon as you start to ask for other people's money, things will change at a board level. Many of you probably have friends, well, let me try this. Many of you may not have a board. If you don't have a board, if you do have a board, it might be comprised of friends, family, uh, close advisors. When you start to ask for outside institutional money, that changes. Um, you're going to have outsiders on your board, and you have to learn how to deal with outsiders. Um, and typically, the board structure that I see is um, two for the investor, two for the founder, and one independent. It's typically a five, um, five-member board. Three to five in a startup, it can get higher, but that becomes very onerous um, and difficult to coordinate from um, making sure you have a qu quorum perspective. But it's also difficult on the entrepreneur. Um, having seven board members that they have to respond to and manage and have relationships with uh, gets to be a bit challenging. So I, I generally tend to gravitate towards the three to five. Um, I find that my best performing 
uh, boards are ones where material is supplied well in advance. Um, so a week before, generally speaking. It gives me a chance to review the material. I can contact the CEO in advance if there's something that's a glaring flag for me that I want to, I want to, to have dealt with. But it also then allows all of the board members to truly participate and provide the value that they're supposed to be providing, as opposed to simply having the CEO read off the PowerPoint presentation. And in fact, the latter case is probably the worst performing boards that I have. Um, I find that when a CEO comes to, comes to their board and says, OK, everybody's read the package? Good. This is what I want to deal with, and has his, his top items that he or she needs to deal with outlined and, and can then engage his board as the advisors that they're supposed to be. Um, those, are the board, those are the boards and the companies that I have found have been very successful. Uh, the one thing that you'll find in relationships with VCs is that because very important decisions get made at the board, they will say, thou shalt not have an official board meeting unless I'm present. And that's a reasonable thing to do. They put money into, comp into, the, into your company. You're spending it. They want to make sure that they're part of that decision-making process. What's not reasonable from a venture capitalist perspective is to continually miss those board meetings. Right? So it's all, you know, if you miss a board meeting as a VC, that's fine. But if it gets rescheduled, then my position would be, we rescheduled. You better be appearing. Otherwise, um, we, I mean, we only defer once. The company's still got it still has to make decision and it still has to move on because the market doesn't wait, okay? Um, the other items that a VC will want to see, most of you are early stage companies. Um, you're differentiated based on your technology and your intellectual property. So most of the due diligence will actually be spent evaluating the intellectual property. And we will want to make sure that anyone who has touched the intellectual property or the uh, technology um, has done the proper assignment to the company. The last thing that we need to do is, is to have a grad student or a consultant come out pre-IPO or pre-sale to, to, to Google saying, ooh, 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 my name should have been on the patent. Um, that's a very bad place to be. So make sure that that's always clean. Um, make sure that you always have your IP um, tied up. The other piece of advice I will give you is to avoid convoluted IP structures, you know, putting stuff in Bermuda or in Hong Kong or, you know, I have to kiss a lot of frogs, and that's a perfect reason not to kiss that frog, okay? And frankly, they will just be unwound. So you will have ended up spending a lot of money, and if you actually want the investment from the venture capitalist, that structure will get unwound if they decide that they even want to go forward with it. Never give anybody a reason to say no. Um, key employee agreements, you would expect to see this, you know, non-competes, non-solicitation, and of course the standard IP clause and all the, all the employment contracts. Next would be the ESOP. You know, as a, as a founder of the company, the company is you, but um, you also have employees, and you will find out through due diligence who those key employees are. We want to make sure that everyone is incented for the company to be in, um, uh, successful, and uh, it just an ESOP is a good thing to have because it keeps everybody rowing in the in the same direction. So, what I have typically seen as parameters is anywhere between 15 to 20 percent. I've seen it as low as 10, um, but that's not typical. It's typically around that that 15 percent, and it has to have enough room. Your ESOP plan before I put my money in has to have enough room for all those key hires that I believe needs to, need to happen. So maybe it's a new CEO, maybe it's a new CTO, maybe it's a VP biz dev, maybe it's a chief financial officer. But before I put my money in, I will, I will want to see that ESOP created. Now, you, as a point of negotiation, you may be able to get part of it done as part of the investment so it's not fully dilutive to you, but just Regardless, understand whether the ESOP is being created pre-money or post-money, okay? Uh, I have a, point, a bullet point up here about board members. Um, I had one person ask me after one of the lectures whether VCs who have board seats should, have, um, should participate in the, the ESOP. And, and philosophically, I, 
I just don't believe that that's the case. That should be reserved for employees, board members, and advisors. All right? I mean, at the end of the day, the VC is being paid to do a job. They don't need to be incented over and above that. Um, and of course, then there's always the, um, that other wonderful clause called uh, other rights and privileges. Um, and that's, that's a big, broad category of stuff that people just shove in because um, they've had bad experiences in, in, other, in other investments, and that's how they're trying to manage it. Um, but this is where it's really important. To, again, I, I, I'm just reiterating it a lot tonight, but get to know your venture capitalist. Know what their habits are. Know what their propensities are. Because at the end of the day, these don't matter in the good times. These matter in the bad times. All right, and a term sheet in and of itself, again, sort of a, a wrapping, wrapping up, is a non-binding document, except for a couple of clauses that are specifically listed as not non-binding. And that's the deadline for acceptance um, and the no-shop clause. So if indeed we decide to enter into an agreement for me to invest, I am going to be incurring a lot of expenses. Um, so I don't want you taking my little term sheet after we've agreed and signed up and shopping that around to every other venture capitalist on the street and using me as a stocking horse. Um, it's not exactly the, the type of relationship that I'm looking for. So I am under the assumption that you have been doing with me what you have been doing with every other venture capitalist who funds in your, your area. And over the course of six to nine months, you've been getting to know them and you probably have a term sheet from them as well. So I will give you a deadline for signing back your term sheet that I give you. Use the time between when I give you the term sheet and that expiration to negotiate a good deal, the best deal possible with me or with any other venture capitalist you're dealing with. Because once you sign that term sheet, we're, we're into it. And my expectation is that we are together pulling ahead and trying to create a deal. Um, I definitely do not want to have a lunch with one of my venture capitalist buddies and hearing that you're shopping my deal to them, OK? Um, so takeaway for tonight for you would be be careful, for, be careful what you ask for as you negotiate those term sheets, because you don't want to send the wrong message. Negotiating a term sheet is very contentious and actually becomes part of my due diligence on you as a potential investee. How are you to deal with when, how are you to deal with when things aren't going well? When we're going to butt heads over potentially things that are, we're just going to have a difference of opinion on? How do you manage that? And what you want to do is give me confidence and comfort in you as a manager and somebody who can manage the business and can effectively manage an investment of my money. And the last tip I will give you is there's a golden real rule. And that rule is that he with the money makes the rule. And that really is the gist of everything that I wanted to talk to people tonight about. Um, I'm hoping that I've given you a few kernels of wisdom. Um, and I am happy to open up the floor to questions and um, any, in, any specific questions that you have. I guess like the longer you bootstrap and the more sales and the more revenue you get, the more the venture capital has to come on your terms, right? I yeah. Guess so. And in fact, in fact, my my best tip is not to go to a VC unless you actually have to. Like if you can build a fantastic, successful company on your own terms, by George, do it. I mean, I I, I have seen good venture capitalists. <coughs> pardon me, and I've seen bad venture capitalists. And what it comes down to is, do you have everything that you need in order to build the organization that you want, right? And you're absolutely right. If you've got traction and revenue and repeatable, repeatable sales, um, if, you, if you have got a really high say-do factor, you know, it, it's all those things. It, there's, there, you have more power in the negotiation. But fundamentally, I don't know why anybody would go out trying to raise money if they didn't have to. So it might be you, you need to execute in order to capture a window of opportunity. Or an opportunity came up to get into a new market. <coughs> and you just can't bootstrap that, right? So the, the, 
So always have a fundamental reason for why you're trying to raise money. My, uh, hi. My question involves exactly that. <coughs> you said avoid venture capital. I jumped up. I, I, I really uh, made, made me think about uh, what I'm tr attempting. I'm s sort of interested in um, trying to use VC possibly <coughs> just to use to purchase accounts receivable and heavily factor them and maybe throw something along the line like some equity to, to make a deal like that. Like, I'm interested in as, as much as humanly possible avoiding mm -hmm. uh, everything you've described, basically. Right. But the idea, <laughs> yeah. but the idea of, of that there doesn't seem to be much of a gray zone between venture capital and uh, almost retail banking. And it's easy to foresee the situation where you have uh, uh, goods and you want to you just pooch them into, into some cash on hand so you can it's get on with things. It's very expensive to do too. Yeah. And it's startling how much pseudo VC there is in all these funds like Omers and teachers and they've got a little corner and there's, is, are there ways to make deals that aren't so inclusive? <coughs> Pardon me, so how about we take that conversation offline? I'll stick around afterwards, but um, I think at the end of the day, VCs are in for an, uh, capital gains and that's the model that they're So there's one line pursuing. to do it this way that's yeah. The normal way. But there's, I mean, there's other, there's, there's factoring and all that other stuff. But let's, we'll, we can take that specific question offline. Yeah. Particularly in the software area, um, one way to suffocate a new company is to give it too much money. Oh. How do you avoid that? Uh, how do you get into the, to the sweet spot, as it were, where there's enough to do to get the business going, but not enough that people will run out and buy thousand uh, dollar chairs and. Uh, uh, yeah. artwork for the walls. Well, <clears throat> that's, that's part of my due diligence. Um, if you recall, there was the, the approvals. So um, at, at a fundamental level, I will always want to see an approved budget. Like we, we will go through line by line and we'll decide who needs to be hired and what quarter and, and why they need to be hired. Um, and I will expect you to adhere to that budget because that's the premise on which I made my investment. So hopefully over the course of that six to nine months that we've been getting to know each other, we've, we've also been able to develop a rapport. Because at the end of the day, this is about trust. And sure, I could you know, go out and buy a $5,000 chair. Um, it's probably not the best way to get the next round of financing from me. Um, the other way to do it is if I'm not confident is uh, to actually just tranche the investment. So there's carrots and there's sticks, uh, which basically says if, if I, so a tranched investment would be I agree to make a, a million dollar investment in your firm, you'll get $500,000 of it at closing, and then you'll get the residual upon the completion of certain milestones. Or at my discretion, because you spent $5,000 on a chair, right? Is there any prejudice towards a B corporation? I, no, I don't think so. Um, I think, but, but what you have to be sure of is that you're talking to the right venture capitalist, right? Um, so really just go, go at it at, um, this is the fundamental business opportunity that's available. I just wondered when you talked about approvals. No, I don't think, I don't think so. I, I'll, let me caveat that by saying I have never heard of it. Hi. Would you uh, comment on the market that seems to be developing between traditional uh, bank debt and VC, so this growing market based on royalty or uh, revenue-based uh, loans that seems to be developing on both sides of the border? Yeah, uh, it's not an area that I'm <clears throat> really familiar with. I'll be frank, I've never done a deal. Um, tends to be at a little bit later stage um, and in fields that um, are, are not my expertise. Um, I would say that anything that if, if, if financing is required and it makes sense from a weighted average capital perspective, that's um, the right thing to do for the company and the board decides that that's the right thing to do for the company, probably the right thing to do for the company. I think that the challenge sometimes with royalties is that they come right off the top and people don't necessarily do the math on following it all the way to the bottom. Can you just take us through the documentation requirements, please? What uh, types of documents do you require from your potential investees and at what point in the process? Sure. Um, 
each venture capitalist is going to be a little bit different. There are some venture capitalists who will do all of their due diligence before they issue a term sheet. And there are other venture capitalists who do a bit of due diligence and then issue a term sheet. Um, so again, that goes to just knowing who your venture capitalist is. Um, and so for example, at the IAF, we did all of our due diligence before we issued a term sheet. Um, at the same time, there, there are partners that we have that we've co that at the IAF, where I co-invested co on opportunities, where they would issue a term sheet at the outset so that they could get that exclusivity period locked up. So just knowing where you are, what their style is, is the first, is the first thing to get clear. Next, uh, depending on where you are in a stage, um, you're, you're going to the venture capitalists will expect to see different things. I will always want to see a cap table. I will always want to see material contracts. I want to see a pipeline. I want to see con customers that I can call and validate against. Um, I want to talk to the management team. Um, so shareholder agreement, <clears throat> existing uh, share provisions, what am I invest? Anything that, that impacts the investment that I'm making. So the existing structure of the company, um, anything that backs up the projections that you're giving me. Uh, but, but at an early stage, the best validation I can get is, is talking to your existing investors if you have them, and your customers or your potential customers. Uh, and that, that really forms a large part at the early stage of the due diligence, because I'm betting on potential. Right? And of course, just all the regular legal stuff that you would, you would expect to see. Does that help? And, um, I always, I do like to see a business plan. Um, you know, some people argue that one of those lean landscapes are enough. Other people say a PowerPoint presentation is enough. Um, I, I like to see a business plan and a PowerPoint at, at a minimum, right? Uh, but then there's all the other legal documentation that would be part of the transaction. Okay. Well, that was easy. I've got one more for oh, you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you commented on you know the numbers that you need to see. So at a high level, a thousand uh, kicks out ten, mm -hmm. and two hit home runs, and two die, and, and then you got yeah. the the, the, the land balance. of the living dead. Yeah. So in your business today. Uh, it's competitive to the extent that you're not the only yep, not the only game fund on the street looking to yep. invest. Um, is it safe to say that there, one of your challenges would be there's just way too many opportunities coming for you to look at? You've got to vet those out, and that requires time and investment. Mm -hmm. y yes, that's one of the challenges. Yes, and and that's why. Remember, I said rise above the noise. Um, I re I really do give more credence to do, to deals that come to me referred. I, it's just, it's honest. Um, and and you your know, peer group would be the same. Pardon me? Your peer group would be the same. Uh, They're I, likely to take I, a first know, look at. I know what I do. I'm not going to comment on what other people do, but it's probably a good bet. Right. That you, it, it just, it's, it's an allocation of time and resources, right? So if there is a trusted source that's saying, surely no, you got to look at this deal. It's a good deal. Well, then I'll look at it. But you know what? If it's not a good deal, He's going to go to the same place that that, that web uh, and filed opportunity went. So people are very careful. It's, it's, this business is a lot about reputation. And um, because at the end of the day, all I have is my reputation. The only, people, the only reason people show me deals is because of my reputation. Um, which goes, sorry, it tweaked something for me. Uh, people often ask if I sign an NDA. And uh, at, the, at the IAF, we would not sign NDAs because we saw so many deals across so many different um, areas. Um, sometimes a, a venture capitalist will sign them. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll sign them at a certain point in time. So you had another question, though. I did. Um, you've been in the business for some length of time. You've seen lots of, of ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. Would you comment on where, what your view is of the current state of the market? I mean, if you look at Crunchbase as one site as an example, I mean, there's it seemingly, uh, it, there's no shortage of money going to food service delivery mm -hmm. companies, yes. you know, which we would have seen back in 96 and 98. So your comment on, you know, is the market overheated and, and you know, I, what's I, the state of it today? Yeah, I think that Canada is a little bit different than the U.S. There's, um, there's a lot of investors in the U.S. with a lot more money. 
And in fact, a lot of US investors are coming up to Canada looking for better valuations. Um, are things, do, do I sense that things are getting a touch frothy? Yeah, I get a sense that things are getting a touch frothy. Yep. But I am, I am, I mean, it wouldn't be a partner at a venture capital firm if I didn't believe that the opportunity still existed. It's a matter of selecting them correctly and finding, finding the right opportunity. So maybe I have to look at 1,500 opportunities instead of 1,000 to find the 10 that I want. Hi there. Um, on behalf of like all the students and entrepreneurs at Mars, I wanted to thank you and everybody that makes it possible because uh, building a stronger community for entrepreneurs in Canada is really crucial uh, for the future of Canada as well. So thank you for the talk and well, thank you. a round of applause for her and for Mars. <laughs> no, it's actually this whole thing, and you all as well. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Don't be afraid to ask, we do have a few more minutes. I'm, I'm happy to stick around as well and just ask, answer questions okay. on a one-to-one -one basis. But. Hi. Um, maybe a few tips on negotiation tactics. Uh, as a founder, I don't have money, which is why I'm coming to PC. Yeah. And what would be a few negotiation tactics that we can use? Never ask for money when you need it. Oh. <laughs> to, to our gentleman's okay. earlier point. Um, it, you know what, just be honest. At the end of the day, that's that will stand you in good stead. Um, so be honest about your valuation, be honest about your expectation. Um, it, and one other little tip, maybe go in high. <laughs> and negotiate down, <laughs> all right? I guess back to kind of more to his point of the negotiate down piece, mm -hmm. you said you essentially take whatever the projections are and then you step those projections going, down. Yeah. Um, so I get the feeling that I sh almost shouldn't even come in with, with realistic projections and I should overshoot I my know. projections yeah. off the bat because you're going to cut them in half anyway. Yeah. But the, the reality is I'm going to cut them in half regardless of what you show me or regardless where you are. You. Yeah. So I might as well show you like double my no, most you know realistic what? No, but, but projections. Remember, those projections yeah. are what I'm going to hold you accountable to. Okay. And that, maybe that's the, the, the message that I'm trying to deliver. Mm. Every, every entrepreneur has showed me projections and, and honestly, they have never come true. Yeah. So from my perspective as surely the venture capitalist. I am actually enthralled when I see realistic projections. Okay. Because I can look the entrepreneur in the eye and I can say, your job is on the line. Okay. Are you comfortable with those projections? And is that the business that we can build on? Right? Um, and then your, your job is to make sure that I'm the right venture capitalist for you. What am I bringing to the table? that this is what I can deliver, right? This is what I believe I and my team can do with what resources we have. How can you goose that return? How can you, the, the venture capitalist, make it better? So finding the right fit with so, the VC. And that's where the, yeah, finding but, a way. But basically, generally speaking, you're kind of looking at coming in with the best case scenario is your projections in your pitch, or are you coming in with like, let's say, let's say I model three projections. Best mm -hmm. case scenario, medium case, worst case that is, Oh, the worst case beyond failing. Right. Which would you prefer to see? <laughs> Ser I'm serious. Honestly, honestly, I would prefer the, the expectation, the, the, so again, this is me. Every venture capitalist yeah. is a little bit different. Get to know your venture capitalist. Yeah. I think the entrepreneurs that I have dealt with, and if you did your due diligence on me, mm -hmm. they would say, Shirley wants to see what you realistically think you can achieve. So come in with your realistic stretch but realistic. I mean, I'm, don't sandbag me, okay. right? But come in with what you think is a, is, you can deliver. And then we'll work on it from there. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. You've obviously seen thousands of companies. And when you're making your investment decision as a VC, I'm sure uh, there are a host of different variables that you're considering. But um, if you could reduce it to just one factor, what, what would you say the single most important factor is in terms of the quality uh, that you're looking for in like that home run company? Team. Because uh, the, the right team with the right product at the right time is the sweetest thing you could see, right? But the right team can make a six purse out of a sow's ear. Um, 
the right team knows when a market is shifting underneath them. The right team knows when to watch what the competitors are doing and knows to be paranoid. Um, what, I, what I really love to see, though, is the right team with the right technology at the right time. Thank you. Uh, I like that last answer. That was good. Uh, the, you said uh, there was five board members. One would be independent. Yep. Where would that independent person come from? Uh, either your network, the network of the, the VC. Um, would it be someone that understands the technology but is not involved with the company or? Yeah, they can't be tied to the company. Can't be tied to the company, yeah. but. And you want to, so there, there's what management's bringing to the table. There's what the venture VC, capitalist is yeah. bringing to the table. Um, the best independent is truly independent of both of those groups. So because independent some, of the groups, but maybe understanding either the market or the technology. Yes. Or, yeah, but, but it really does come down to what does the company need that independent to be at this point in their life. So <clears throat> early, early on, I might say, I want to see an independent who's experienced in, in the science. Or I would say, because they've, they've built a company uh, in this field before and know all the players. Um, maybe if the company needs to go out and do a really big financing in an, a year and a half, I want to make sure that there's an independent who has done a massive fundraising. But just what does that company need at this point in time to get it to where it needs to be and achieve its master? So as a VC, you'd, you'd probably lean towards choosing the independent based on your, because uh, you're the one with the most risk, right? So you would choose yeah. someone that, so in a sense, there's a, a sort of a three to two, if there's ever a decision to be made, there is a possibility that I could be a You can always look at the independent as a biased person. Uh, but I have never th uh, shoved an independent down somebody's throat. Okay. And one last question. What's the difference between someone looking for uh, $500,000 or $50 million in, in capital? Is there a different, tech, a different way to do it? Is there a different uh, group to go to? Yes. Or? Yes, there's absolutely. So you, you tailor that to yeah. you look for someone who manages the type of money or? Yeah, so that's, a, that's the get to know your VC. So, I see. Um, there are VCs who invest at the seed and early stage, really the early stage, um, and then there are VCs who invest at the growth stage. And if you're a seed and early stage guy, you never go to the, the guys who are looking for, you know, repeat, who, who are looking for that growth okay. other, as a growth investor. And it's just, you gotta do your homework, which is typically why it takes six to nine months because you're trying to figure out who those people are. Okay, hey, thank you. Okay. Great talk. I just want to ask, uh, what, um, how much experience do you have in uh, getting involved in, in a business uh, or a, an industry that you're not personally uh, right. familiar with? And is that typical of, of VCs or is it, uh, you know? Um... In, in Canada, I would say it is more common to have generalist VCs, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, and that's why having an independent who is a subject matter expert often pans out really, really well. I mean, building a business is kind of building a business. There's some basic fundamentals that you have to follow, some standard rules of the game. And really, it's about have you built a business before, and can you help guide the company from that perspective? And what type of a Rolodex does that VC bring to you? right? Because if you're looking for them to help you build that extra premium on the valuation, then you should be doing your due diligence on who, who can they connect you to to help you become a better company? Does that help? Yes, thank you. We do, sorry, we do need to end here, but Charlie, you will oh. be around later yeah, for, quest absolutely. After for questions. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.